thanks, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I know I've spoken before at these things, but what I thought might be more useful today is actually to do um, sort of more factual around the nature of the cover-up and how, uh, to some extent, a cover-up is orchestrated, because I'm sure a lot of you um, if you weren't aware before, would have been made aware over the last month since the Hillsborough, the findings of the Hillsborough Independent Panel. Um, if you want, when we're, anything you don't know after that, I mean, you know, feel free to ask. And the value of these things, I think, is more in the questions and answers. But nevertheless, I don't mind giving it a bit of structure to um, maybe some things you might want to challenge my interpretation of some of the things. So um, I've just said collusion and cover up because some of us have been saying that for a long time. And um, we're hitting our head against a brick wall for many years saying that because. Um, we were constantly told that wasn't the case and it was, um, you know, everything had been done, everything was above board. And for someone like myself, um, and just briefly to give the background where I initially was involved, first as a volunteer um, assisting the Hillsborough, um, the Hillsborough Working Party in Liverpool City Council. I had friends who had been at Hillsborough and who went on to form um, that working party. Um, and like a lot of people in the city, obviously was fortunate that I wasn't there and I didn't lose anybody, but obviously knew lots of people who, who were there. Um, I then was employed as a, a researcher on the first project, which was commissioned by Liverpool City Council, which really produced the first critical account of the aftermath of the disaster when I was based at um, Edge Hill. And in the course of my time um, attending inquests and being around the various agencies, whether that be um, the police, not so much in the very early days, I have to say, um, the ambulance service and um, hospital managers, what I saw very clearly emerging was a cover up, um, but it was very hard in the early days to actually get people to believe that other than the people who had been there on that day and who had experienced it. So I know the frustration I felt, so I can only imagine the frustration people felt as survivors who had their experiences denied immediately and subsequently for 23 years. So really I'd like to show how the, um, those inquiries which occurred after Hillsborough which on the surface um, were to investigate the true circumstances, actually were managed and mismanaged to orchestrate cover-up. And um, it, it's not in direct chronological order, but there is, there is a logic, my logic, and I don't know how much that counts for. Um, as you know, the Hillsborough disaster occurred um, at the time of the um, the Tory government under Margaret Thatcher. It was a time where there was um, the government was keen to introduce ID schemes and there was no better way to roll that out than with football supporters. Football supporters had um, a negative reputation. They had um, generally, Liverpool supporters specifically, and Liverpool as a city had a negative reputation, a reputation around militancy. And, um, you know, the north of this country had been devastated um, under the Thatcher government. So there was a climate whereby um, football supporters were treated like animals. And I've said before that um, the terminology used was animal terminology. Um, football supporters were corralled from the, um, <coughs> the, tr the train specials um, and herded into pens. And if you look at police orders, you will see that terminology, animal terminology. And you know, it was that terminology and those actions which led to the Hillsborough disaster, a totally avoidable disaster, but it was part and parcel of a set of circumstances um, which led to people being um, overcrowded in pens like animals. And immediately after the disaster, the um, Lord Justice Taylor um, was invited to inquire into the circumstances of the disaster and reported on it very quickly um, within a matter of months and was unequivocal in, in saying that um, the cause of the disaster was the breakdown of police control. What the Hillsborough Independent Panel showed with the, re with the evidence it had access to was that Mrs Thatcher was not pleased 
with the findings of Taylor. And this is where, you know, you see how dominant she was, that even, you know, her home secretary at the, the time, Douglas Head, was actually um, willing to accept the criticisms and the facts um, which Taylor had made available. And um, she actually felt it was a devastating criticism of the police that couldn't really go uh, unchecked. Douglas Heard um, had stated that Peter Wright, um, who was the then Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police, he, um, he, should, he has to resign. The enormity of the disaster and the extent to which the inquiry blames the police demand this. But she would not have that. She was willing to accept the broad thrust of the Taylor report, um, but in terms of recommendations, but she would not accept it because it was a devastating criticism of the police. And as she said, is that for us to welcome? So again, you have to see that within the context of the 80s and the context of um, South Yorkshire Police and the miners' strike. And others have written on this um, and, and spoken about the South Yorkshire miners in relation to the battle for Orgreave and um, generally the role of the, the South Yorkshire mi uh, Police played in policing of the miners' strike. And um, I mean, I've sat in court, I sat in the inquest where some of the senior officers involved uh, on the day of the disaster, it was their proud boast that they were used to crowds like this because they had policed the miners' strike. Um, and so a lot of people have argued it was payback time. There was no way Margaret Thatcher was going to see her police force condemned. And of course, what we saw in the leaked cabinet minutes which came out at the beginning of this year was that um, the blame on fans um, you saw the collusion within the police because whilst it wasn't recorded what South Yorkshire police were saying to Margaret Thatcher in the cabinet minutes early after Hillsborough it recorded what Merseyside police were saying especially what Ken Oxford the then um, Chief Constable of Merseyside was saying and again you could see from the language he used it was identical that he had taken um, the word of South Yorkshire Police so what you saw um, and I'm, you know sort of I'm very critical of Jack Straw but I will say the one positive thing he said over the last month which was how the police at that time acted with impunity and um, clearly they did they acted with impunity and collusion at that time and so you see at the very beginning there how um, the, there was attempts really to corrupt the findings and not take on board and of course for those of you who that have studied the Taylor uh, report you will know that it's in two parts the interim report and the final report and I always refer people to the interim report because that is where you get the cause of the disaster by the time it comes to the uh, final report it's generic in nature referring to um, recommendations around all seater stadia and is extremely weak on um, again not referring to prosecutions of officers or anything re given that the first part was so strong um, the next I'm leaving out the inquest for a bit, but the next major thing, because again, it, it's topical again, was the role Jack Straw played, because Labour over the last month have been keen to um, really capitalise on this report coming out and um, certain, you know, sort of Merseyside MPs in the last year or two um, have made moves and noises to be um, uh, involved around the campaign for justice or the call for justice but um, I am very um, clear in my criticism of Merseyside MPs because we go back to uh, 1989 and Merseyside MPs across the board were appalling in their lack of practical support um, for Hillsborough families and survivors. And I'd go so far as to say they didn't do anything. In fact, I think it's been shown recently that they actually tried to kind of calm things down at one stage in relation to Jack Straw. So although Labour have been making a lot of noises um, from the 12th of September, let's not forget 
for the last 23 years between Hillsborough happening and that report coming out Labour were in office more than the Tories they had 13 years to sort this out and it is to their shame that they didn't in fact what you see here is actually how they actually made the situation worse because when they were in opposition Jack um, Straw in particular and I remember going up to Blackburn and um, meeting and a lot of families went up to lobby Jack Straw and he was we'll get into power I'll be Home Secretary we'll order um, a fresh inquiry of course what he did when he came into office was nothing like that we ended up with what was known as the Stuart Smith scrutiny and I've done a bit of a timeline here because I think it's relevant because when Labour were elected into power uh, on, in May 97, um, it put Straw in the position to keep his promise of a new inquiry. Um, by the 5th of June 97, before the scrutiny was ever in place, uh, he actually was saying, my officials have thoroughly examined the alleged new evidence and have concluded that there are no grounds for establishing a new public inquiry. But he was concerned that um, people wouldn't, you know, he, people had, would hold him to his promise. I am certain the continuing public concern will not be allayed with a reassurance from the Home Office that there's no new evidence. Too right, it wouldn't have been allayed. Um, I therefore propose that there should be an independent examination of the alleged new evidence by a senior legal figure. This alleged new evidence that he is referring to wasn't alleged at all. It was fact. It was evidence that we had gathered and had taken to the um, High Court in 1993. We took to the High Court the fact that um, people had had pressure put on them to change statements by the West Midlands Police. We put to them the evidence of Dr Ian West, the pathological evidence that people could have been saved. In fact, a lot of what come out in September, the report that came out, actually used an awful lot of the evidence that we took to the High Court in 1993 and which was dismissed. The evidence that is now being used that people could have lived and we now know it was 41. At that time, um, we, pre we took, actually it was eight, we, six families went to the High Court, but um, Ian West looked at eight post-mortem reports for us and said they could have lived, they, they, they probably wouldn't have lived. But even out of that random, well not random, yeah it was random because we didn't know before we got the evidence, um, quite a few of those were actually have ended up as one of the 41, some of the 41 that could have lived. So this alleged evidence wasn't alleged at all, it was fact, but he was referring to it in these official reports as alleged and this is prior to him ever um, reporting, er, ever uh, establishing the scrutiny. And the 9th of June, again only a month after coming into office, um, a memo, a restricted memo to Tony Blair said, Jack Straw does not believe that there is sufficient new evidence for either a new inquiry, reopening of the inquest or prosecution of individuals. Um, and again, June 97, um, Home Officer Minister, again, uh, to a police representative, said that there had been creative thinking without reopening the whole affair. So you see the build up to the scrutiny. Um, yet the 30th of June 97, when Straw met with the families, um, he stated, I'm determined to go as far as I can to ensure that no matter of significance is overlooked and that we do not reach a final conclusion without a full and independent examination of the evidence. Note he doesn't say alleged evidence when he's speaking to the families. Also note that, you know, what he's saying there totally contrasts with what he is saying uh, in government, uh, to government ministers. And then... Um, Again, the 9th of February, uh, 98, this is the scrutiny is established. He established, he appoints Lord Justice Stuart Smith. I don't believe that was any accident. He's, a, you know, he was, I mean, you know, you could argue that, you know, most judges are right wing, but he was at the extreme end of right wing. And um, I remember Dave Church, who lost his son um, in the disaster, being outraged. And I actually went with 
Dave and his wife Maureen to give evidence to the Stuart Smith scrutiny and um, Dave Smith was uh, Dave Church was actually going on about his MI5 connections actually challenging him because it doesn't appear anywhere in the report as you might imagine but uh, some of the families were well on to the guy's connections at the time and so this scrutiny began which didn't have the status of a public inquiry and it's actually uh, did more harm because superficially it gave the impression when it was reported well there's another inquiry and still there's no evidence and even before it was published um, Jack Straw was stated, stating that the report which would be coming out um, this report should draw a line under speculation about further investigations or proceedings and in respect of the amended statements he said there's bound to be questions about whether anything in this process might amount to misconduct of a criminal or disciplinary nature. Um, Lord Justice Stuart Smith considers that it wouldn't. The 18th of February, the report was published and no action was taken. And I remember being in the House of Commons in room 13, which I always thought was ominous, where Jack Straw met with the families before he presented the findings of the report uh, to the House. And um, he said, well, we believe you. you, you know, they did change statements and we've here's a copy and there's the amended copy, but it wouldn't have made any difference. And, you know, so we have looked into it, but yeah, nothing's going to happen. And it was such a stitch up. And, you know, as you know, it became known here as the Stuart Smith stitch up. And that's all families refer to it as. But I do recall, and I think this is significant because it was brought out in the Independent the other week, that at the time when we were in room 13, um, sitting beside Jack Straw was George Howarth, one of the Merseyside MPs, the MP for Knowsley. And Jack Straw, um, George Howarth, um, we now know, together with Jane Kennedy and Peter Kilfoyle, um, and through documentation, and I haven't put this uh, on, on, um, on, on one of these, on a PowerPoint, but um, they actually... Um, stated that they would keep the local media calm on this and they've denied that they've denied that um, it was reported in the independence the the echo didn't run with it the echo denied that they would have been calmed by anyone which is a bit of a joke as well but um, they nevertheless we firmly believe they were part of that because they were always useless and in particular in respect of peter kilfoyle um, he was the MP for a number of families, but in respect of the Glover family, who I've always worked very closely with, and since the early days, um, John Glover, who lost his son, has always asked me to attend things with him. And, and you know, I, I've always been privileged that he's tr entrusted me with personal information. And John requested a meeting with Peter Kilfoyle um, in, in respect of his son's case. And... Um, and, and he was his MP, and Peter Kilfoyle refused to meet with him if I was in attendance, even though I was there uh, as an advocate for John. And you have to ask yourself why. And um, I did ask Kilfoyle, and he came out with some cock and bull story about only seeing his constituents, and I wasn't one of his constituents, and I wasn't one of the families. But you know, I, I'm fully aware of you know why he wouldn't want to um, sit down with me. Um, and this has been part and parcel of the whole thing where families have been manipulated because not all families are strong why should they be they're damaged through being bereaved not all families are political they they actually take people at face value um and it's been a real um hard learning curve for them what the Stuart smith's uh, scrutiny did was then give families you know, another another closed door because you know what you've had an inquest, you've had uh, the judicial, you had the Taylor inquiry, you had the inquest, you had the judicial review, you've now had this just go away. And I remember after this, it becoming so difficult to see where could you go. It was actually very, very difficult legally because it just closed off avenues um, and made it very difficult. And part of the reason for that. Um, was down to the Hillsborough Steering Committee. 
A few weeks ago, the Echo rang me up. Um, that in itself is an achievement and says how far the Hills for Justice campaign has come over the years. Because, and I, I sort of throw in these little asides only because, well, they spring to mind, but they have a relevance in terms of any of you involved in campaigns, or it will ring true with a lot of you in terms of things you've been involved in. When the Justice campaign was first formed, almost 10 years after the disaster, nine years after the disaster, um, for very sound reasons, because they, the members, the families didn't want, who are part of the family support group, objected to sitting down with the son and negotiating with the son, which is why the split occurred, as well as the fact that families, those families, always felt survivors should be involved and general supporters like myself who could support and assist in a campaign for justice. And when the justice campaign was formed, the Echo would not print anything. If we told them we were doing anything, they'd never ask us for a quote, but they'd never even print anything. And we sat down with editors who said they would not publish anything that we, they wouldn't acknowledge us at all by publishing anything because they didn't want to confuse their readers by letting them know there were two groups. Um, I remember saying to them, you should never underestimate your readership. So to get to the stage of um, 2012 where they're actively wanting quotes from you um, says an awful lot about you know sticking at something and how things can change over time but the echo rang me on the Thursday after the report had come out on the Wednesday and said can someone rang me and said and did a list said these are the people these are the people we see as the main people involved in causing the, in create, either causing the disaster or being involved in the cover-up. And they ran through the list and they said, have you left anyone out? And I said, yes, you've left the Hillsborough Steering Committee out. And they said, oh no, they were, the, they were the, the lawyers for the families. And I said, yes, you've left them out because they were part of the cover-up. And um, it has a relevance for all of you, as I'll, I'll say in a minute, in relation to one of them. But, and again, a lot of this has been, so on the back of that, and fair play to the guy I spoke to, he went away and did his homework and came back and said, oh yes, you're right, because I highlighted Doug Fraser, who was the solicitor who acted for the families at the inquests. And Doug Fraser, um, he certainly didn't have a presence uh, in court which would inspire confidence and that's kind of me being nice um i i was i, I can say this again because I, I was i was in the at the inquest so I'll, I'll stand by the comments that i make even if they appear subjective at times but Prior to the inquest ever taking place, there were a number of meetings. There were some what was known as business meetings, and at some of them, um, the families would be involved, and I remember being in attendance at some of those. But then there were private ones just between the coroner, West Midlands Police, government officials, and the Hillsborough Steering Committee. And it was at these, one of these meetings that Doug Fraser came out with these amazing comments, whereby in organising the list of inquests and how many they would go through in a day. He said in reference to one family, well, you better get them in early in the day because if not, they're likely to swell the coffers of the local hostelry before they arrive at the inquest. That was a solicitor who was representing families and families were paying three and a half thousand pounds each to be represented by these people. The money they received from the disaster fund they used for this representation. Um, everyone's appalled by the 315 cutoff, and I'm sure everyone knows about that 315 cutoff. And for years, Popper, the coroner, has been vilified. You know, how can you, you know, have a 315 cutoff when it was only, you know, sort of, um, it, it rules out all lack of care in the emergency response. What you find in the documents is that Doug, the coroner, was actually relatively generous. Because Doug Fraser was saying, have the cutoff time of six minutes past three. You couldn't make this up. I mean, that was the time when the game stopped. So he was actually ruling out even more time. And he's representing the families. And again, he met with um, a lawyer for the police force, a guy called Metcalf, who had a key role that we now know in the cover up and the changing of statements. And he stated, I think that there will be one or two families who are going to be problems, he meant. I mean, that's his kind of misquote. There will be one or two hotheads who will look for the ulterior motive behind this, i.e. the cut-off time and the nature of the inquest. The vast majority will go through smoothly. So you've got to say, who's he working for? Um, and that was the whole thing. 
And then afterwards, he actually commented, in, and it's recorded, the vast majority of families were very satisfied with the way the inquest had been done. Well, I don't know where he was, for all I know, on the last day when the verdicts were, you know, recorded, I still have in my head the noises which were horrendous of people wailing and screaming and people fainting when um, accidental death verdicts were recorded. And I remember Theresa Glover, mother of um, Ian Glover, actually being told to get out of the court. And when we went outside into the, um, the lobby, it was in the town hall in Sheffield, um, she was on the point of collapse. And her son, her eldest son and me, kind of had hold of her, trying to prop her up. And we were told to move her because she was a fire risk. And we had to drag her along the corridor into like an ante room um, because she was in the way. And there was no way uh, we met with lawyers in the office on the day that the verdict came out because on the first day of the inquest uh, the resumed inquest when they said there was the 315 cut off I remember going to Trevor Hicks and said you've got to get this inquest stopped um, you need to go to the high court on this you've got to do it now and he said I'll be in the high court in the morning and then he spoke to his re the, the lawyers and he was paying them, he wasn't paying me, and he listened to them. And they said, oh, no, no, we'll put all our eggs in one basket. We'll get all these things that are wrong. And then at the end, when we were all in one room, after the inquest verdicts was announced and um, it was finished, and they said, what do we do now? And they went, nothing you can do. It's over, nothing you can do. And they took the money and they ran. And they were never seen again. There was no, nothing after that. And. Doug Fraser was appointed, irony of ironies, a deputy coroner of Liverpool in two, year 2000, where he still is deputy coroner, um, rubbing salt into the wounds. Liz Steele, um, she subsequently wrote to the coroner, she was the chair of the steering committee, she wrote to him and praised him for his care and sensitivity, in particular the arrangements he made for families at the inquests. Well, I don't remember many families thanking him. And, you know, yet she said that's been appreciated by both them and us. She was very shortly after appointed as a circuit judge, and she is currently on the board of the governors here of, of Liverpool John Moores University. So make a note of that, please. Um, and um, whilst, you, whilst you're making a note about Betterson as well, and, you know, so. Um, Tim King, who was a, a junior barrister representing the families, um, although Bennett Heitner was the QC employed by the families, he was there on only two occasions, and it was Tim King who um, was the barrister who acted at the inquest, at the resumed inquest, and he wasn't there on the last day when the verdicts were, were announced because he was in London getting his silks. He'd become a QC. So, you know, um, call it coincidence. Um, and I, I actually didn't believe in conspiracy theories until actually September when this came out. I still was a little bit in denial as to the, and even though I'd been around it for so many years. Um, so you saw there, the families had little chance. What chance did they have of challenging the inquest um, and the form of the inquest when their own lawyers, who they trusted, families didn't have a legal background. And really, on the basis of the evidence given to the jury, you couldn't blame the jury for coming back with accidental death. You really couldn't, on the limited evidence given. You couldn't pin the blame. And the juries went on and on, and as you know, were the longest recorded in British legal history at the time, which the coroner proudly announced one day that we were eligible for the Guinness Book of Records. Again, the level of sensitivity, um, which they, this is the a level of sensitivity that Liz Steele thanked him for, you know. And so after, you know, you'd had those inquests, you'd had um, the judicial review, where again, after this, we got, lawyers who, who good lawyers who worked for nothing um one of whom's in the room today um and we took that evidence to london and to the high court where it was dismissed and it was always going to be dismissed within that political context of 1993 but the Stuart smith scrutiny further closed doors for people um norman betterson his role in the early days, his name wasn't bandied about much. We all knew Duck and Field Murray. And through, 
I knew the names of officers because they popped up as kind of um, at the inquest of having moved bodies and or you know taken statements etc being around things but Norman Betterson's name came into the frame we'd heard it bandied about as he was part of like this elite team set up to orchestrate a cover-up and we now know that was true. Norman Betterson was part of um, a group of South Yorkshire police officers that met very shortly after the disaster and orchestrated a smear campaign against the fans. What um, Maria Eagle referred to in 1998 in the House of Commons as black propaganda. And clearly the evidence is there that um, these people had to be demonised. So the myth even though the Taylor inquiry had put paid to drunken ticketless fans, it didn't matter. You could still push away. You had the Sun headline. And we now know that, you know, sort of, you know, it, it, you know say Calvin McKenzie's name and rightly everyone um, is, is horrified by it. But we do know what we always suspected that, you know, not he made the headline up, but the information came from somewhere. And it came directly from this group of people that Norman Betterson was involved with in relation to... Um, spreading the lies about uh, Liverpool fans and he was part of that there's no two ways about it um, and they were meeting they met in a restaurant to actually plan a lot of this and he has, be, he has said in the last month that he you won't find his name anywhere he played no part in it well you know if he was at a pre-arranged meeting in a restaurant what was he there for if it wasn't to be part of this and when you think it can't get any worse in terms of really, you know, just families being treated so awful, we find out he's, going, he's applied to be Chief Constable of Merseyside. Fortunately, by this time, the justice campaign was up and running. And very quickly, we stood in the city centre and collected signatures over a couple of days and we got 15,000 signatures. And we took those signatures to the police authority and um, we presented them and we, um, we sat in. We, we, we had a sit-in at the police authority the day he was being interviewed to be appointed um, chief constable. And we pleaded with councillors to vote against it. And... Um, we, I mean, there's still a lot of visual evidence as Pesh should have done some of those pictures of us, you know, sort of picket in the place. And I always say it's, it's kind of like really kind of bothered us at the, the time. People in the police authority were really nice and they sent out for sandwiches and, and pots of coffee and tea for us and really looked after us. And it kind of, but, but you know, they were just people working there and they kind of understood what we were about. You might have seen this week, he, he was appointed anyway. Um, several people didn't vote or voted against it. Uh, one, uh, Steve Folks from Wirral, he resigned on the strength of it and fair play to him because um, other people, a couple of others uh, voted against it but you know stayed in office. Carol Gustafsson who was the chair of the police authority, she had been approached to to, um, you know, not to appoint him, but she was, um, you know, her, her, all her communications indicate that everything was proper and he would make a very good um, chief constable. He didn't mention in his CV, by the way, his role in this, as you might imagine. Um, she was rung up the other day by the Echo and um, asked <coughs> about her role in this. And she slammed the phone down on the reporter who said, um, because she, she said that was, and she's quoted in the echoes you might have seen the other night as saying, um, everything was proper in terms of his appointment. I don't want to talk about that time, that period of time. My life was hell at that time. And I think, well, if her life was hell, um, how did she imagine it was for people watching this man being appointed as chief constable? to Merseyside um, and he became and let's not forget you know this man then people who are making noises people standing on St George's Plateau on the 12th of September you know Norman Betterson was a regular contributor to the Roger Phillips show um, there was a great rapport there let's not forget the people in authority who never challenged him over the years the people who did business with him over the years um, and I know that when people have tried to ask him this, they've been um, 
they, they, they're not allowed on the radio. I'm not one of them because I wouldn't even waste my time ringing up. But I know that people have ch tried this over the last few weeks and have been blocked. Um, he left Merseyside, as you know, and became chief executive of Centrex, which is a now defunct um, organisation, uh, which was training effectively training to police forces and other security institutions in the UK and worldwide. But then he was appointed Chief Constable of West Yorkshire in 2007, where he currently resides. He couldn't sort his pension out with West Yorkshire. Um, they wouldn't, weren't prepared to take his pension on. So instead, he negotiated a £60,000 pay increase, bringing his pay to £225,000 per annum, which is currently what he earns. Work out what he's earned over five years. Um, under severe pressure, obviously, because the IPCC are uh, going to, um, you know, they're investigating him. God knows what will happen with that. Um, I didn't think he, you know, I thought he'd stand firm because he's one of the more intelligent police officers. Betterson is a clever but slippery character. Um, and I think severe pressure was put on him to retire when he announced his retirement last week. However, he's not retiring until next March, so we must remain optimistic on a number of fronts. However, when he does, he will receive uh, his pension from Merseyside, £88,000. The idea at this, you know, mo after everything, that people will be contributing to his pension. And legally, that is the case. That will happen unless some criminal proceedings, as I understand it, occur before that time. Um, and I know that, again, a little aside, but um, someone sent me a photograph last week and it was um, of a protest outside West, uh, the police station with uh, Justice for the 96 and Sack Betterson. And I didn't know who'd done it, but then I recognised one guy from Barnsley on it. And, um, and I put the picture out and other people had got onto it. And on the, they're now doing another protest uh, November the 3rd and they're doing a public meeting. So it's not, you know, and this is the great thing of how it brings people together. It, you know, people in this area, in, 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 in West Yorkshire area are as horrified. And I've done quite a number of uh, interviews, you know, radio interviews over there in respect of this. But you can see, again, the character of it. Um, and it's what is so frustrating that people like Betterson can kind of just be barefaced enough that even in the face of all the evidence, just go, I didn't do anything wrong. And you know the subplot is that they still believe the lies because it happened because they believed the lies and because of how they perceived working class people. And I, you know, I, I always say, and, and again, it's made me unpopular with um, some Hillsborough families, that I've always seen Hillsborough within a, a class context, because football was a working class game. Not so much now, but it clearly was. And it was that, that factor which enabled people to be treated like that. And actually, I, it's my firm belief that this has gone on for 23 years because the establishment was able to drive a wedge through people who perceived themselves, working class people and people who perceived themselves as better than them, even amongst families, which is a tragedy really. But as you know, the report came out last month and what it clearly showed was um, an, an, you know, an institutional cover-up by the police and also by other agencies, uh, by the ambulance service, for example. And again, we've been saying that for years around the ambulance service um, and, and how the lack of response. Because what happened was when anyone broke ranks, um, how they were treated within the workforce. Um, uh, an ambulance officer who we got to know well, a guy called Tony Edwards, uh, he was in the first ambulance that got on the pitch and um, drove right past Kevin Williams, who was alive at the time, and because um, he was told to, and he lives with that, and is a very traumatised individual. You might have seen him interviewed at times. And he wouldn't stand by the official verdict of things. He wanted, he, he was saying the ambulance service had, had were at fault, um, the, and we had to learn from it. And ambulance statements, was, uh, personnel statements were, were changed. And he had a really bad time with it within the ambulance service. And eventually he left and lives in a remote place now. But um, so it wasn't just the police, the cover up went on at uh, many levels. But there was that, um, 
you know, what the report brought out was what we'd all, kn all known, anyone who, who, here who was at Hillsborough or anyone who knew anyone who was at Hillsborough, what we'd already known. There was a cover-up, police lied and police changed statements. Or when people were considered credible witnesses, they were never called as witnesses because they were credible. Yesterday, I sat with uh, members, some people from Liverpool Social Services in relation to trying to, to actually develop some support for people because in the justice campaign, we're actually swamped at the moment in terms of trying to help people. And you have this situation where in particular, you know, you've got a couple of bereaved families and survivors who are active members of our campaign trying to counsel and help other traumatised people. They're traumatised themselves. One, one, one of the families, you know, discovered the other week that his brother was one of those that could have lived. And he's deeply traumatised, but he's putting it on hold, which isn't healthy. And there has to be responsibility and accountability even now. And what is frustrating is I sat with um, Joe Anderson in the summer and said, there's got to be something set up. And I said to Steve Rotherham, there needs to be something set up. Yes, there's something being set up. And I said to both of them independently, um, the resources for this can't come out of the local budget. The local count, the council are cutting services left, right and centre. You have to, it was a central government problem, funding has to come from central government. Um, I don't believe that has happened as of yet, but clearly the system that's in place at the moment is inadequate and they have indicated that they will increase the team because no one knows how to access it other than by ringing care line and they will only speed it up if in that conversation you have with Caroline, you mentioned the word Hillsborough. If you don't mention the word Hillsborough, you will not be put to this thing. And, um, and there was a bit of sidestep when I was trying to get it to, well, how specific is the support you're going to give? And it's because what is needed is specialised treatment. And I, sorry, I've, I've digressed a little bit because yesterday I brought with me um, a survivor of Hillsborough who is incredibly articulate and who over the years um, has had various kinds of therapy and counselling because of his trauma. He was fortunate, and he'll tell you he was fortunate, that in the early days he visited, his GP was very good and said to him, you must write this down, it doesn't matter whether it's in order or anything, you must record this. And he has said that's been the most valuable thing. And his story, which I, int I actually intend to put it on our website, but I'll make sure I pass it to Vicky. Joan people, if people want to read it, because it really is um, valuable in terms of a survivor, someone surviving with people dying on his arm, literally people dying, touching him and what that's done to him. But his, his statement, when they came to see him and he gave his statement, they said, oh, this is wonderful. You're so logical. You're a very credible witness. You can guess he's still waiting to be called from 1989 and of course he realizes now this is a regular guy you know not not kind of overtly political and he would have he would have believed in the system at the time now this guy you know kind of throughout the years has become increasingly traumatized at different times and um, needed different kinds of therapy and I have been saying since the summer you need to utilize someone like him who is willing to talk about what works for them what doesn't work for them and so even now there's no real joined up thinking with a lot of it and a lot of it is show a lot of it is superficial which is very frustrating but also, we now know that 41 of the 96 could have been saved. What led them to investigate that was the evidence we gave in 1993. It's now 2012. They drew heavily on uh, Ian West, a pathologist who's now dead, in relation to that. And um, the, first, the, the thing that really shocked me on the day, because um, I really thought it was unshockable, and I kind of I said it somewhere on radio or television or something that and I, I, I kind of gasped audibly in the cathedral when the, you know I knew the blood alcohol was taken in the in the, um, the deceased and for me the most obscene was taking it in a 10 year old boy but to actually find out then that in two of the victims where there was no blood alcohol 
they hadn't been drinking. The police then accessed the national computers to see if they had a criminal record. What do you do that for? Well, they were sober, but they were criminals. Not the, <laughs> just that, what, what other reasoning can you have behind that? Specifically, this hasn't worked, so let's look at this. And I, I mean, that to me, I was shocked. I mean, I was really kind of shocked. And again, the other thing in relation to the, again, um, in the cathedral when the day when the panel released its findings, again, it really, and I think it's because of the venue and it's the echo of the Anglican Cathedral, what really um, kind of uh, got to me was when they announced that 41 of the 96 could have been saved. That not only you had the gasps which echoed and you had thud, thud, thud as people fainted in the room. And that was to me mirrored what had happened years ago. All those years ago, it was still happening. And I know one of the mothers was taken to rush to hospital and admitted one, you know, an older woman. Um, and so again, the impact of that. And I don't know, you know, we can reflect on the impact of that. I don't know, it, after 23 years, you, finding out, you know, that literally in some cases, this person just needed to be put on the side so they could get air. In the case of, um, Michael Kelly, Stephen Kelly, who I was talking about before, Michael was the first out and literally he was, he was left on his back and a police, actually, a police officer said he was alive and uh, he was instructed to leave him. And he went to go back to him and the senior officer said, leave him, go and form a cordon across the center of the pitch. And he only needed to be put on his side and he would have lived. So, you know, I think people have a righteous anger about those things. My frustration with the report was that um, the government of Margaret Thatcher was effectively let off the hook. That was very, very frustrating. Um, the argument was there, was there was very little written evidence. Um, but I think, you know, that, and, but there is still stuff, you know, that stuff has been redacted out of the report. There, there are things, it's not 100%. Moreover, West Midlands Police were let off the hook. As you know, I've said, you know, and we know that the West Midlands Police is the investigating force. Some of those officers had been part of the serious crime squad. One of the senior, former head of the serious crime squad was um, the coroner's right-hand man. He had set someone up on a, uh, uh, on, a, on an armed robbery charge and that person spent 18 months in Winston Green prison. Um, the evidence for that is, is overwhelming. And yet this, the ca that was the calibre and they were brought in for their expertise, which was altering statements. Um, and, and that's what happened. I found that frustrating. Also, and it, it's other people have pointed this out, whilst the report was warmly met and so it should have been, nevertheless, it's still another establishment version of events. What has happened is, um, and it's critical obviously because the facts speak for themselves, but nevertheless, the facts are that what the panel has done is utilised all the evidence and statements with, that were there relating to the police, the ambulance, government agencies, etc. Where's the fans' evidence? Fans are ignored again. <laughs> we always say fans are the forgotten victims of Hillsborough. And even by this report, the terms of reference. And actually, I, I, did, I know I did a talk a few years ago where I was very critical of the terms of reference of the remit of the report, of the, uh, of the panel. Because one of the things was that the survivors were being excluded totally. They weren't going to be involved in it at all. And my concern about that was, um, once again, they were being overlooked. And we fought that one. This is the value of a campaign. We battled on that one and we wouldn't give up. And we got the, pa we got the bishop to come to the steel campaign shop and everything and basically got him to meet survivors. And so much so, and I did kind of feel it was, it was a bit being, you know, sort of, it was a bit like Sophie's choice when I was asked to do this, but nevertheless, I felt it was um, a step forward when I was asked shortly to the report, uh, after the, before the report came out, I was asked by the Home Office to um, give the names of 20, uh, 25 survivors to attend the cathedral, to be addressed by the panel and receive the report. Now, I know it was a sop. It was. Clearly, though, that was how far we'd come. That survivors were recognised to the point where they were invited to be at the cathedral and to be recognised 
as people who had to be vindicated, really, because of how they'd be. And, I, you know, I'd have loved it to have been at Anfield and to have all, all survivors there. But nevertheless, they were a representation. And, you know, other people took us in that vein. So that was something, again, that only the campaign and actually moved forward. <coughs> that was last month. So we get to this month. And, you know, after all the euphoria, and this is my concern, and this is why people have to remain on the ball with it all, nothing's changed. The accidental death verdict still stands. And that could have been quashed by now. That could have been quashed with immediate effect or almost immediate effect. There's no police, no police have been sacked or suspended. Um, although Betterson's <coughs> been reported to the uh, Indipla independent police complaints. And next week, there is a Home Affairs Committee to hear evidence from families. And 22nd of October, there is a debate in the House of Commons. In relation to this, and, uh, and again, I'll flag this up and you can, might want to ask questions on this. I found out about this 16th of October thing on Twitter because Keith Vaz, the MP, chairs that committee. And he said, Hillsborough families will be um, given evidence to this committee. So right away, I emailed the Merseyside MPs and said, oh, um, I thought, I'm not going to go, why have our families been left out? I thought, I'll have to take a different tack. And I said, um, oh, um, we didn't, we, uh, we've only just found this out. And um, can, um, we need to know the details. What, how do they want the evidence? What form do they want it in? And what's the time scale? Because we need to make arrangements for them to come to London. Um, Andy Burnham, well, not, not, not a mere son. And Andy Burnham has been involved, didn't reply. Maria Eagle was the most positive in saying, she, Giving me, telling me how to access the right guy and everything. Uh, Steve Rotherham contacted me and said, um, oh, Keith Vaz has invited the Hillsborough fa Family Support Group to give evidence. So then I wrote directly to Keith Vaz and actually said, um, you might be unaware of this, but the fam Hillsborough Family Support Group do not represent the majority of families. Um, in fact, the largest group of families don't belong to any group. And I can say that because the ho that's Home Office in terms of all the evidence they've collated, that's it. And the justice campaign, uh, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't want to, an, an, to overlook people in, in light of all, everything that's happened recently. You wouldn't want to exclude people. And so he... Um, he replied saying uh, he didn't want to exclude anyone and send a representative, which I know other people won't like. But um, so that will be next week. And so we'll see how that goes. Um, so as it stands, nothing's happened. Now I can only speak in terms of what we're doing or where it's at now in terms of, you know, action taken. Um, there's a request being made to the Attorney General to quash the inquest verdicts in all 96 cases and to order, well, to, to send it to the High Court to order fresh inquests. Um, also, the DPP has been contacted to consider criminal proceedings in the light of the recent report and also a request for a public inquiry, although I do know um, certain Labour MPs aren't happy with that. Maria Eagle indicated that today, but you're not surprised when you realise the role Jack Straw and other people played, why they wouldn't want a public inquiry. So that's basically where it's at. Now, in terms of the justice campaign that I'm involved in, the, um, the families um, have uh, gone, uh, are being represented by, um, at the moment, by Pete Weatherby, um, a barrister from Manchester and um, Elkin Abramson in Liverpool and have received advice from Jeremy Hawthorne who is here today and um, we've had to do that because although you, you're probably aware that Mike Mansfield is involved um, our families can't rep be represented by him because they're not members of the family support group I think I'd like to think Mike Mansfield didn't realise what he was getting into, quite frankly, because I don't think it's very good for his image uh, being involved in, in that kind of sectarianism, really. But nevertheless, uh, the issues stand no matter who's representing the families. And um, that is where it's going. Um, nothing's happened. The pressure that has to be exerted has to be political pressure as much as legal pressure because there are lots of legal arguments why not to go forward with things. I wouldn't advocate them, but clearly if the inquest verdicts are quashed, 
But then if there's talk of criminal proceedings, the inquest won't proceed whilst there's outstanding criminal proceedings. So you're talking about a long time scale as well. So it all becomes very messy. And again, you know, um, as I've said before, people are dying. People have died along the way. Aside from family members that have died, um, survivors who've died, the, the number of suicides and equally the number of people from just from September and this, the, the enormity of this and, you know, sort of just other little things. What got really brought it home to me, and it was only Vicky mentioned it to me before because it had gone out of my head again. Um, is the normalization, how things over a period of time become normal and patterns of behavior become normal. I've been involved in this for 23 years and it was a throwaway remark. I made a throwaway remark the other week. Someone said, I wonder were the phones ever tapped of Sheila Coleman and other people. So I just went, oh yeah, but too long to go into because it was a tweet and it kind of escalated where people were ringing me up and I was like oh no why did I say anything because I'd kind of forgotten about it all now that might sound daft you forgot your phone was tapped but in the scheme of things and when you're under pressure you've just got to carry on you got my phone's tapped okay and carry on and you know just to contextualize it was when um, six families were going for judicial review and I was I was working with them on that. Our phones were tapped, there was no two ways about it. I won't go into all the details of it. Um, I was always of the opinion it was the police that were tapping the phones. I never saw it as hacking. Although when that, someone, I think it was The Independent did a piece on that. And Tom Watson rang me and said, um, you know, about it. And I went, oh, Tom, it was ta phone tapping. It wasn't News International. And he went, oh, it would have been Sheila. It would have been them as well. Very matter of fact, as he is on all this now. And, um, and so in the course of the conversation, I said, well, it could have been, I suppose, because then, then it's what I started to reflect on. It. I went, oh, yeah, because I remember, remember my flat being broken into a couple of times. I remember one occasion. The only thing that was robbed was me, um, my address book, you know, and the, the telly was there, the video, an expensive camera. And they only took my address book. And another, you know, and I just think, oh, well, you know, and it's kind of, you know, you work and you've got a young kid, you've got to get on and you either give in because it was pressure being another time when I was broken into, I went, oh no, my bag's gone with all my papers, Hillsborough papers in. And I live in the park and it was scattered all around the park. And I took them then as it was, they were, you know, it was a frightener back off because it, for the same reason I was followed around Sheffield years ago by West Midlands police you know take this as a little warning and I don't know maybe if I'd been able to luxuriate if I lived a kind of relaxed kind of life and I did wallow in those kind of thoughts I might have gone oh I'm not you know this is getting a bit but and then I was asking my son who is now a man but it was a you know a young boy at the time and I said do you remember he went oh yeah yeah remember when our phone was tapped and you'd ring up and you could hear so and so talking in their house and remember when we got broken into and I thought god my poor kid just accepted this as normal living you know this is what happens you know so um, it didn't seem to do him any harm, I have to say. He's quite a well-adjusted adult, much better adjusted than I am, I have to say, um, in spite of me. But the point is, that's what happens, those kind of things. And you have to decide whether you're going to stick with it or, you know, go from it. And th those things will probably happen again. Um, I was asked um, to sign the, um, some of you might have seen a letter in the Observer on Sunday from the Hacked Off campaign and, um, I, and, and I was happy to sign it in relation to, you know, on behalf of, of the Hillsborough campaign and um, even every time my name comes up with either on Facebook or Twitter and it's someone says my Twitter name with um, something about hacking, someone who follows me on Twitter or someone on my Facebook is then um, hacked because then I get like this thing coming to me um, and it, ha it happens all the time and I, I don't open it or anything but I tell the people that it's happened um, and it must spark something off I mean I don't know the technical side of things I think it's all magic you know it's easier to think that way but um, it will happen again the, the more you know these people are not going to go away and they're not going to just take the, the threat of prosecution quietly and, you know, the establishment will close ranks on this, as it has done. But I think the point in it all is that it's all encompassing. It wasn't just... South Yorkshire police weren't the only baddies. They caused the disaster. 
a set of circumstances led to a dilapidated stadium. Um, the sh my thing was so in the House of Commons last year when there was the e-petition debate, Clive Betts, the Labour MP for Sheffield, stood up and it was everyone's JFK moment. Um, something that could have been done in 20 minutes took four and a half hours because everyone wanted to say where they were the day hills were happened. And I actually found it quite nauseating, to be honest. I didn't find it a, a memorable day or anything. And I thought that was a little bit of a stitch up. Or I wouldn't go into it now. But the thing with um, Clive Beth stood up as this Labour MP and I was at the match that day. I was leader of Sheffield City Council and every, you know, the tears were there and everything. I thought, why doesn't someone stand up and say, you were the leader of the council. Why didn't that club have a valid safety certificate? It was there begging to be asked, but no one wanted to ask questions because everyone was too busy patting each other on the back. And that is the problem. And now that is happening. And you will find that even the, the, the MPs that have been at the forefront of this recent episode of Hillsborough, they will be very reluctant around the criticisms of Jack Straw or any of the Labour MPs. I challenged Steve Rosner, I did a live podcast on radio, a, a thing on Radio City through the, um, the Anfield rap that some of you might know. And they did, we did a link up with um, Rotherham and I didn't know we were going to do a link up with Steve Rosner, but I couldn't waste the moment and said to him, you know, about Straw, just change the subject, wouldn't have it. Um, and they won't, and that's what you will find. And I have to say, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not, if not direct, I found it really nauseating that, that and, but it is their choice and you have to respect people's choices and decisions. When members of the family support group accepted an apology off Jack Straw the other night and um, basically said, well, there's nothing can be done about it now. Well, there can be. This man lied and colluded before a scrutiny was ever established. He decided it was only alleged evidence and nothing was going to come about it. The chronology is there and that's why there needs to be an investigation. But how it all weakens by people accepting apologies and it's the currency of the moment, isn't it? Saying sorry. Everyone says it. It means absolutely nothing unless the action follows. And as I said, you know, the Hillsborough disaster was an avoidable disaster, but it's happened, that's a fact. But everything else that happened for 23 years was avoidable. And that's the bit that's unforgivable. Because I do believe that had people held their hands up 23 years ago, the bereaved and survivors could have moved on. They can't move on and they couldn't move on because um, they, were, they were lied to and demonised for 23 years and that really is unforgivable and it's a, it, it's a marker, it has to be a marker for the society <coughs> we live in and, and it, it has been a tremendous miscarriage of justice and remains a miscarriage of justice, make no bones about it in relation to, you know, because everything is, is as it was. But I do think that, you know, and, and again, I sort of urge you, anything around political pressure and any of you, if you can exert any pressure at all, please keep that pressure on because we can't just leave it um, to legal remedies because there will be enough reasons not to pursue legal remedies. The political pressure has to be um, kept on really. So thanks very much for inviting me anyway. Voice was missing, by the way. And that was the uh, David Blunkett, who had still been writing for the source newspaper, yeah. and yeah. still funded by, I think it's 60,000, pound a year that he makes. Um, but it's, your, it's this seeming deference to the national state from um, all politicians, really. Yeah. And unfortunately, <coughs> that filters down to. Some of the families, families, yeah, I would, yeah, uh, yeah. I yeah. Is that right? yeah. I think that to, to take your first point around the FA, um, I totally agree. I think what happened was there was a begrudging, what appeared to be begrudging apology from the FA after the report came out because initially they didn't apologise. And I feel, and, and certainly people like yourself and fans who were there have felt for years that the FA got off the hook really lightly on this because let's not forget um, they had decided on that venue it was their responsibility to ensure that that ground had 
a valid safety certificate. There was the issue of contracts here in terms of tickets. People had tickets. There was contracts entered into, and there was, you know, so there was an element of illegality in terms of how that whole um, how the club was operating, but also that the FA in deciding. Um, who got what end and it was all about money and it still is and I think that um, again the best place you will see the emphasis on the FA is people if you follow um, certain sports writers on Twitter people like Tony Barrett um, and, and other sports writers who will will keep it there but generally um, the FA is still on the on the sidelines here and has never really been held accountable. And I'd like to see um, it being Hillsborough and the FA being part of a wider investigation into the FA generally, because it's obviously not only into Hillsborough where they're shown to be um, corrupt and partisan, you know? And as for your second point in relation to the deference, I mean, I totally agree with you. You know, I, I said, I, I found that whole thing on, and um, what was more made it worse for me um, it was the 17th of October last year, it was my birthday as well, so I had to sit through all this thing in the House of Commons on my birthday thinking, <laughs> this is all just, you know, backslapping, as I said, and people were let off the hook. You're right, you know, um, MPs like Steve Rotherham um, are big, you know, in terms of the, you know, the sun boycott and don't buy the sun, but they don't challenge people within their own party, um, and it is so frustrating the way they will seek to let other people off the hook and make excuses for them. And, you know, I met with um, Steve Rotherham prior to going to that debate in the House of Commons. I met with our families and him and said that, um, you know, what we wanted, because you have to remember, we'd initiated that e-petition. We initiated that because the <coughs> government appealed the Information Commissioner's um, report uh, decision to um, release cabinet minutes as being in the under Margaret Thatcher as being in the public interest and the government appealed that and I will argue although I've argued at the panel they said it had nothing to do with them but I know and I can tell you that the day that was announced that the government um, that the the um, the information commissioner was going to re reveal the cabinet minutes um, and release them. I had a phone call off the Home Office, the secretariat to the panel, saying, oh, you don't want this, you don't want this, you don't want information release piecemeal, and patronisingly saying to me it was all like a big jig jigsaw puzzle, and this was only one part, and why didn't I wait for the whole jigsaw? And I said to them on that day that uh, the justice campaign would be very angry if anyone chose, you know, if the government appealed, and of course they did appeal but by the so on the back of that we initiated the e-petition and as you know it was the first one to be debated in the house and the the huge amount of signatures we we got in a week um, nevertheless by the time it got to Steve Rotherham taking it on board and reading the um, the motion out it had been watered down so much that the cabinet minutes be released to the panel that wasn't what we said. We wanted the cabinet minutes being released in accordance with the information commissioner as being in the public interest to the public. Now what we did by that, what, that was the compromise, that was the buy-off. And what that enabled was the panel to have access to far more documents than they would have done. Through our e-petition, we acknowledged, we, we enabled that, uh, the panel to have more. And I've pointed this out to the panel that they should have thanked us and <laughs> they didn't, but we really did through that. But the point was, it was um, that thing of letting people off the hook and that will continue to happen and that concerns me. And in particular, they will say now, which if, if I was to speak to some of the Merseyside MPs and go, well, Jack Straw, you know this, this, this happened, they'll say, oh, but the family's accepted the apology. And the sad thing is that, and it, 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 it is like, you know, a metaphor for society that there will always be people who will be bought off. And sad to say that includes the, some of the families who are a mix of a whole range of people who are seduced by um, meeting MPs and, um, having an audience with to the exclusion of others whereas you know and, and I think it's obvious from from the group that I'm involved in and in that we always seek to kind of get everyone together and indeed have called for everyone from the early days we asked for the panel to meet with 
all Hillsborough families together and not to buy into these divisions but they refused because it's easier to keep people segmented and apart. <coughs> Anyone else? Tony? Uh, yeah, I was interested, Sheila, in um, what your comment about um, uh, you, you, you took this ultimately as a class analysis. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you don't need to be an Althusserian to sort of talk about the agents of the state mm -hmm. or the repressive state apparatus here. Um, but uh, my, my, my question is, in terms of what role did journalists play in the sense that um, I was aware of David Conn's reports in, in the 1990s, which were really buried, where he took the West Yorkshire police to task and effectively, was the, to my mind, was one of the few journalists that sort of said they had to pay out, I think it was 1.3 million pounds to the miners, <coughs> which effectively was accepting uh, yes. I, 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 I just yeah. wonder, was it all of these journalistic sort of networks that sort of give um, a bit more impetus to the justice campaign? It was difficult at times because um, I remember Brian Reed being at the Echo and um, I remember him saying at one point, um, after he, I think he'd left the Echo at this point and was at the Mirror, but he said that someone, he was at something and I criticised someone and uh, who was present and was shouted down. And Brian Reed made the comment of like how um, in the early days when he was at the Echo, how it was me and someone else who'd kept, kept him, you know, on the ball on stuff because most people wanted to go away. It was too big to touch, it was too difficult, it was too much of a headache. And he said, you know, and he, he recounted how when I gave him the evidence of, um, in relation to Kevin Williams of um, the police, the, West, uh, the South Yorkshire policewoman having her statement altered by West Midlands Police, and I gave him that story, and he went, even with that evidence, the problems he had trying to get that published by the Echo. And that was mirrored to a great extent at a national level. And it, w it went in waves, in and out. But in the main, there are a few who stand out um, in terms of investigative stuff. And um, David Conn, in the, um, the, the stuff he did, was based, you know, he did put it out in that way. But you see, even though it's there, it's still ignored. And there will be, you know, a flurry of, you know, activity around it on, you know, increasingly on Facebook and stuff. But then it goes away. But certainly journalists, um, where it's frustrating is you would meet with journalists um, you, or, or TV or whatever, or radio, they would interview you and um, stuff would be edited so heavily. Like the and, and anything, you know, I always say, unless it's my own viewpoint, I will say this can be backed up. The stuff I was saying about Stanley Beachy, who was the former head of the Serious Crime Squad, I had that, you know, chapter and verse. I had transcribed phone calls of how he was setting, how he set this guy up when he, um, and, you know, was saying, and I've told you this before, and he was saying, um, okay, okay, you'll need a car. Well, I can arrange for you to get a car. This was a tout who was working with him. Um, you're going to need a gun. All right, that's a bit more difficult, but you, you, I'll get you a gun. Because George, the man who was framed, had to be armed when they framed him. Of course, the reality is he was in Liverpool when the robbery was taking place in Leicester, but he still spent 18 months in Winston Green. And, and that was a measure. But trying to get them to name this guy, they'd chop it to bits, they wouldn't put it. They wouldn't put it. But it wasn't down to the individual journalists. That was more editorial policy a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just a kind of comment that follows on from, I think it's a comment that follows on from what Steve was saying, which is that, you know, the, the cacophony of, of apologies, I agree, was, of course, sickening, right? Absolutely sickening. But it's also very dangerous um, because it, 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 it's created this kind of sense in which, and I think there are real, there are real similarities with some of the discursive ways that the establishment and the state have responded to the financial crisis, right? Which now we kind of have to forget about the causes of and just suffer the fucking consequences. Yes, of, right? yes, yeah, yeah. And, this, yeah. and, the, and the, the discourse is this, that we, we and all these apologies mount up to this, we were all to blame, 
we were all to blame and we were all to blame therefore really means like no one's really that yes. much to blame yeah. so you know the apologies from the fa from politicians of all sides some are around now some are around then you know jack straw sitting on some bbc show yeah. from out his biography saying well of course i'm sorry and echoing many of the things you've, you've, you've yes about yeah you, like, yeah yeah. Um, you know, the way the cover up in the legal system, the way some of the people in the media, Kel Kelvin McKenzie's come out and kind of half said he's sorry and blaming the cops. We're all to blame and no one's to blame. And actually, the other thing I wanted to say, which you'll know and other people who are kind of, you know, like do sad things like I do, like speak to football fans and follow message boards and go to games, there's still a generalised sense out there. I'm sorry, I don't mean to mm -hmm. offend folk, but there's also still a generalised sense that the fans were also to blame. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Even though they've been completely mm. exonerated, yes. So I think this, I think it's uh, it's both offensive and disgusting, but also politically very dangerous. Which is why it's really good to have that list of con yeah. concrete yeah. actions up there, because the, the the independent panel, as as forensic as it appears to have been, mustn't be allowed to be used as a mug of closure. Which is what, of course, the establishment. Well, yeah, and let's not forget, because it was it's called the Hillsborough Memorial Archive. And it's the word archive. Their remit was never to make recommendations about prosecutions or anything. The remit was to review the material and archive it, put it to bed. And that's what it was about, really. And I think you're right, the idea that, you know, um, th but this idea, because it's a blanket thing of blame, well, therefore, you can't single out. I also think, as well, there was a huge degree of ineptitude in it on the, on the part of some professionals, and that was exploited. Um, I, I mentioned Doug Fraser. Doug, I wouldn't have Doug Fraser representing me, and certainly, you know, kind of wouldn't even want him as a coroner if I was dead. But um, he because he just didn't come across as you know having much about him the coroner was the same dr popper was so totally out of his depth he'd have been out of his depth at a an average kind of normal individual inquest he was way out of his depth but it suited the establishment because you could manipulate him he literally had west midlands police acting as his coroners they were the coroner's officers and they were the ones who policed it. And you know, and you, you know, those of you who know, they, the West Midlands Police were the investigating officers for South Yorkshire Police. They were brought in by them uh, for the coroner and for the DPP. So you had this same police force with a reputation for corruption uh, service in those three major inquiries. Yet they've been let off the hook. And I find that very, very, and that's one of the things that's, you know, that's gone to the DPP around as well. So, but I agree, a blanket thing, <coughs> then everyone's to blame. So no one's accountable or no one can take responsibility. It's Dane. And people have been let off the hook. Yeah. A question here. I just want to allude to one of the comments you made about this being an intensely political event because I think it's worth mentioning because a lot of the people in the room, the younger people in the room, it's, it's, we're talking about it, events that they yeah. didn't live through no. and weren't, weren't present to see and, and hear about themselves. Um, it was an incredibly political event because the reason why it became possible for the ambulances to drive past people as they were lying down, dying on the floor, and for individual police constables to not put people into, um, just to turn someone over to keep them alive, was because these, these events, I mean, I think you, if I remember, you alluded to this briefly in what you were saying, that these events were at the pinnacle of what had been the most vicious yes. and vitriolic attack and assault on what were seen to be two centres of resistance to the Thatcher government during the 80s. The, the miners on the one hand and the trade union movement and yes. the Labour Party yes. in, in, in Liverpool. And that's speaking of why you've got such a widespread conspiracy in effect. Because, I mean, it, it, it's always worrying when you find yourself talking about conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Like it, no, I don't either. Because people start looking at you yeah. as if you're a bit strange. Yeah. But really, it's worth reminding ourselves that all you need for a conspiracy is for the, the, the desired outcome to suit enough people. Yeah. And the outcome here suited an awful lot of people. The Thatcher government, 
had been in the process of vilifying Liverpool in particular, yes. the, the lives and the labour movement in general, but very specifically uh, Liverpool for a long period of time. And this was part and parcel of that. The, the, as I said before, the reason why people were prepared to, to believe what was being said, the reason why the sun could sell the headline that it did. And as you mentioned before, it, even today, some sections, even of fans, yeah. still aren't totally convinced of, of, about what happened, was the massive and pervasive assault that took place. And obviously that's the reason for, or part, part of the reason for the Tories' defence of, 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 of the position and part of the establishment defence. But we shouldn't forget as well that the outcome of that situation suited the Labour Party as well, suited the leadership of the Labour Party, yes. Yes. it suited the leadership of the parliamentary <coughs> because they were involved in directly in attacks on the Labour movement in this city as well. Um, I, I was a victim of it directly. I was expelled from the Labour Party at that time. You were. I was involved in I was a at that time, I wasn't an academic like I am now. I was work for a living. I was a, a, a you had a real union, job. <laughs> trade union, again, trade union <laughs> representative for local authority workers, and we actually lost members uh, amongst the, the, the yeah. delegation. So we, we knew yeah. personally yeah. What, what was going on. But the Labour Party itself, or the leadership of the Labour Party, was involved in what you could describe as a preemptive civil war at the time against the left in, in, in the movement in general, but within their own party. And they were quite happy with that, and they, they, they seized upon that. And then they couldn't then later on retreat from that position and had to defend it. That's why you got Jack Straw in particular as a leading person within yes, that, yeah. taking the positions that he did. Yeah. So it's a conspiracy that's really mm. widespread, well, and, and intensely political, and, in and an intensely class. I think um, I think there's there's two two things there in what you said is that you you do tend to forget that sometimes and I forget this with a lot of the support we've got people weren't born then people weren't even born or they were very young and of course when we're talking about football if you're viewing it through the you know the lens of today it's very different if you don't remember it what it was like then and you know you sort of you, you know I stand here as someone who was in the boys pen from there was seven my, there was only a very few girls who went in the boys pen at Anfield um, and I was one of them um, and graduated to the cop by the time I was 11 so I mean totally different game you could do that as a kid go on your own to the match and I'm not romanticizing it because the consequences of that led to that but um, I think the other thing, um, so, so it is important that it's, it's remembered within that, but the point you made about um, within the context of the time, when I spoke at St George's Hall on the day the report came out, um, I hadn't planned anything to say because I'd been caught up all day and being in the cathedral doing stuff. But what came to me, you know, thank God something came to me, but what came to me as I was just about to speak was where this all began, how far we got from where we began. And where it began in terms of immediately after the disaster was Liverpool City Council. And what was the remnants of the ILP at the time, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, forming the Hillsborough Disaster Working Party. Harry Chase was, I think, the leader at the time. And... Um, at that time, that was where the action, the stuff they set up, which enabled people like me to do the work I was doing, and also to set in place ground safety advisory committees, etc. those things. And along the way, they've always been forgotten. And I think it's important, and I, I actually drew it back to that because I thought it was important, because I often think if there hadn't have been that resistance still within the city, what would have happened after Hillsborough? because it gave a focal point and it enabled, because again, I said when I was on St. George's Plateau was that when the lawyers had taken the money and run and I got barristers to work free, we didn't have our train fare to London. We had no money and it was Liverpool City Council paid for the six families to go down to London and that was how we did it so you know and, and you know I mean I can be you know vastly critical of the council you know in, in the, the years after but at that time it was part and parcel of the resistance you're talking about and that fight that was still in people so and I do think it's very important that it's seen within that context yeah
Okay, you've got a question at the back. Okay, one then, then. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Frank? Yeah, she, <coughs> excuse me. It's obviously evident now that the police who uh, documented or changed the documents uh, on that day or during that time were actually corrupt. And the DPP looks like <coughs> it possibly could take it to court. And the question basically is if it's seen that they are corrupt and they're facing criminal, criminal uh, charges which are successful, and it's been sort of reported that some of these officers have received, on average, £93,000 compensation, uh, while I gather the families received £3,500. 23 years ago, £93,000 would be something like a quarter of a million pounds. And if it's been seen that these people who've received that for emotional damages are basically, not to put a final point on it, frigging liars, Will that money be taken off them? Now, that's a question. The second one is, a, is, a, is an aside, to, you know, an overall view. Before it was mentioned by Tony with regards to Altazir and uh, a, a class analysis of it, well, I'm not being rude, so I want to say this. No shit, Sherlock. Because the class runs right through this. I don't know if it's Bernard Shaw said, it's a war out there and the enemy of the poor. And that's it. If this was Chelsea fans, Norwich fans, any other fans, it would, wouldn't be allowed. I'm not saying this because I'm a Liverpool lad, I've got a chip on my shoulder. But my view is this, where do people go who were who, who are sexist? And in the last 30 years or so, the women's movement done really well to stop sexism. Where do these people go who are racist when black people have, have attended that sort of issue and tried to pull it down? Where do the people go who are homophobic? Where do they go? You go and set websites up. We hate shops, let's kill shops. A few years ago, I actually contacted BBC, because on BBC too, some funny fella uh, rang in with a joke, and the punchline was, uh, what was it, uh, scumbag scousers. My argument was, what if they put in scumbag Irish, or scumbag Jews, or scumbag uh, Arabs? It wouldn't be acceptable. So all these people who, who, who are, who are who can't be as sexist as they would now, it can't be as racist as they would now. They find a, 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 a sort of a, a port in a storm, and I think they look around for particular groups of people that they can get away with. And if you don't like it, uh, you can't take a joke. Yeah. Well, I think that the first point is. Um of course, some of the officers are now dead, and the difficulty around criminal proceedings is, I mean, I always argued, you know, South Yorkshire Police should have been accountable under Peter Wright as the Chief Constable. He's dead now. Um, there's talk about, you know, um, bringing, uh, that Duck and Field could be tried again. Um, the difficulty there is, I mean, what you don't want to go down the road of is private prosecutions. The DPP needs to deal with this. Um, I think it's, and, and that is the danger that people will want to go down the road of private prosecutions. Um, with regard to money being taken off them, I mean, you know, it's one you say, have they still got it? And um, clearly if the money was, was if, 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 if people receive money in, in relation to trauma, then I doubt if it would be taken off them because those, you know, tr that trauma, um, you know, would, would still hold that they were traumatised. But in relation to the, um, the issue of class and stuff, I mean, I totally agree with, with, the, with the whole thing that you're saying around it. But, and of course, it's political. But what you're stating as kind of, you know, the obvious, if you like, wasn't that obvious? Because, Frank, if I told you over the years, um, the arguments that I've had because why am, Hillsborough's not political, don't make it political. That's what you're told. I mean, I know, and uh, you know, I'm, well, I don't care if I am breaking confidence really, but I know that the, the, the Sunday after the Hills, after the report came out, the family support group met with, um, and, and for a link up with Mike Mansfield and Lord Faulkner, why they've got him involved and why he's involved, I don't know. But anyway, um, the president of the family support group, Trevor Hicks, um, said, and I can't tell you how I know he said it, but aside from being very scathing around the justice campaign and saying they would have no involvement, said he personally would never stand on a platform with Sheila Coleman, given her dubious past. Well, I reckon I must have slept through it, or it must have been that good. It's a case of the 60s, you know. But really, um, 
how I read into that is my dubious past i.e I'm perceived as political so even now these people and let's not and I don't want to home in on individuals in one sense it's not fair but when those people stand as representatives I mean you know it, it's it, it, Trevor was on television the day the report came out saying how he was a, such a you know he really supported Margaret Thatcher until Hillsborough he was also the break it was the tiffin point because when there was a vote in the family support group around meeting with the son and um, families were up in arms about it it went to a vote and he was outvoted so he said okay well Trevor the chair as he was then Trevor the chair won't go but Trevor the father will go and met with the son and that was why people like John Glover Dave Church and others went I'm not you know um, that's it and they were off to, um, to and formed the justice campaign which is far broad based so for me it's always been about class because I know from my early involvement the people who were hounding me either you know elbowing me in court or ringing me up or were going this is wrong this is wrong all the people who had that sharp perception were working class people in the main, very poorly educated working class people, but people who were intelligent and had that sense of right and wrong and had that street sense to go, oh, this isn't right, what's going on? So for me, it's always been about that, but, but it's, it's even now, it is still a battle. Um, yeah, and yeah. Dave, just touch on the earlier points, like from your own experience of the last nowadays, you still get that sort of treatment off, like your Chelsea fans, your Man United fans, no shit singing, you killed your old fans and whatever. And like on our generation who were in who were even born at that time, it's still a stigma that we've had to fight off and that we've had to you know, try to educate our peers and try to educate you know, all the football fans who just think we're still scum, basically. And it's the same problem that we've had even to a day, to a point now in university, like when on the course that I'm doing journalism and that's all about like trying to beat these lives at the sun not published. But um, just to touch on that, um, last weekend there was another campaign against the Sun. Um, I think Morrison's had the promotion. Didn't yeah, it? Saturday at Magol, yeah. Like yeah. That, you got so much money off your shop. You had £10 off your shop and if you spent £60 and had um, a voucher, you bought the Sun. Yeah. And, um, basically, the fact that you did that, what does it show? Like, to the most recent attempt at apology, like, and how you're still trying to fight off their accusations, even though the current senator came out a month ago along with your Mackenzie's and your FA's and that saying you were sorry for what happened. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, but in first hand, I mean, I, I accept what you're saying initially. Um, and yes, that's the legacy of Hillsborough. You've inherited it, you and a lot of other people. But I would also like to say that um, in terms of, and you do have to put up with, with the chance with the singing, but equally as well, I know that for every awful email we got after the tw on the 12th and afterwards saying the usual thing it was multiplied by 30 or more plus manu fans chelsea fans saying you know it could have been us and being very supportive but also as well i'd just like to say that the strength of the justice campaign has been with people like yourself i mean you know i i know you and um and you, it, for me, it's been for me being involved in other things. It's always you know you always need new blood. You always need young people in. And the wonderful thing is that it has been younger fans that have taken this on and done some really wonderful stuff and have been there and have wanted to if they didn't know about it have wanted to educate themselves or they have already been educated through their own family and it equally as well around the journalism and the john moores i mean you know kind of that we're always quite responsive to any request and that also has been heartening not just with local students but with out of town students who have come wanting into views or whatever um, the Morrison's thing on Saturday happened because um, Thursday night um, Peter Hooten rang me and he said his friend had rung him and said that um, he was in an Evertonian by the way his mate getting his shopping and um, he got to the counter and whatever he'd spent the girl said to him oh you can get £10 off this so he went oh great yeah how is she said oh do you only need to go and get a copy of the sun he went you are joking 
So um, you know, so he said, yeah, I paid the money. And he rang Peter. So Peter checked out with Morrison's if it was part of a campaign. And it just kind of grew from that. And that is the wonderful thing because um, people just got up there on Saturday. By which time Morrison's had swapped it to, I'd got wind of it and had swapped it that it was if you buy the Times, you got £10 off. <laughs> but the, me the message was the same. The message was the same. Um, the message was the same and it was important. Um, the manager from Morrison's was brilliant. The staff were brilliant. Um, and, you know, they, they were sending us messages afterwards saying, you know, we all support what you do. Plus the visual thing was, was it was great, really spontaneous, people who turned up. And what it showed was, and people do say this, well, you know, the son apologised, Mackenzie apologised. Um, I don't even say it's too little too late because the caliber of you know and the content of that paper has been exposed way beyond hillsborough uh, w through the leveson inquiry i do think um mackenzie and people got off really light <coughs> in leveson around hillsborough i have to say um nevertheless um it's just shown i just think we have like a, a social uh, responsibility to boycott it wherever we see it irrespective of hillsborough now um but the impetus is hillsborough and that boycott, and it does carry on, and it stands for so much, and it sparks. If I told you the number of emails we deal with from people wanting, you know, don't buy the sun stickers from all over, and I mean, and people send photographs in and they're from all over the world. It's really quite funny because it's like that thing with gnomes now. People you know where they send postcards of gnomes, people go on holiday and sort of, you know, and it, it, the, we've got, we, we must do a book actually of some of them, yeah. Sorry, but we, we did that ourselves when we went to New York. That's the scene, so yeah. So we put the stickers on top of the, um, the Rockefeller Centre. Yeah. Yeah. And when we were in Central Park as well, we like, put them up in there and like, got, got sold off. Like, seen a policeman come over and rip them off with them. Stick them up again. Absolutely brilliant, and people will take those photographs because they, they come to us. Look where we saw this. You know, I mean, it's. I mean, I remember years ago doing it with you know the miners, support the miners, just all around Portugal. It was everywhere, you know, and it's the kind of you know. But it's great, and it's actually in the depths of a, a campaign when it's going nowhere. Just getting a photograph like that from the top of the Rockefeller, it's really quite uplifting. Anything like that, but I do think that it's it goes beyond, and hopefully, I'd like to think that what the sun boycott has done has edu it is it, it's signposted people and it's 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 educated people as to why you wouldn't want to read this anyway and it has created a debate around the press Ju uh, just this man then you yeah did you yeah, point i wanted to make um i'm very pleased to hear about the morrison campaign because johnny anti-apartheid <coughs> did similar tactics in tesco and other places whereby you fill your trolley up with South African goods, mm. you get to the kidney where you pay your money, you say, oh God, I'm South African, so you put it back. Yeah. And it's amazing how many people fear the back suddenly started putting South African goods back. So it's a very good tactic. Yes. My, my question is, because it reminds of a famous saying by a famous individual, Claude Colburn, the more it's officially denied, the more it must be true. And I really believe, listening to what you're saying, and the way the establishment, even now, I don't say these, uh, some of these th statements Labour MPs have made because Jack Straw should have been sacked, kicked out on his of course. for selling us out. Yes. Uh, now, the problem I think you've got is you're fragmented to an extent. And by that happening, because this is, to me, if summing up everything today, that's the action statement is paramount to what goes yeah. on. But tragically, I think if you split you up oh, yeah. and buy yeah. people off with mm. fudge things and, you know, sort of, well, you've been right, you get a pat on the head, you've done a good mm. job. Mm. But the very people who are responsible, because it'll happen again, and the very same people responsible have got off the hook. So I think it's paramount I know. importance. I know. Whoever you get in to say, we stick together, we want nothing less than those Three points up there. It's, 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 Unless yeah. you do that, yeah. it'll disappear into history. I, I totally agree with you. On the South African thing, um, I always recall, um, and the Tesco thing, I, I remember m my son saying, um, can I have one of these apples or are they South African? Because, <laughs> you know, and, and so he'd shout it, which was great. And yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, 
you know, it was a great way because you'd, he knew why and he'd tell his mates why and everything. And so I totally ag agree with you. It kind of, it's, it, it, it's how you educate in a broader sense. I totally agree as well on the issue of division, but it's really hot. Before the report came out, um, I was at a, a function for a showing of a film of these people did this Hillsborough to Anfield run, ending up last April at Anfield, and they put it together in a DVD and we were invited to it and the f representatives, from, people from the family support group were there as well. So afterwards they said any questions and I said, so I, because I knew the report was coming up, I stood up and I said, um, I said, well, really not a question, but you know, this, re this film shows what you can do with teamwork when you stick together, you ran this, so, you know, you're all got fed up and tired at different stages, but you're all GD each other on. And you know, really, it's really important. And I sort of turned to the family support group and people in our group didn't know I was going to say it. We'd obviously always discuss that, but we, I didn't say, I didn't know I was going to say it. And I said, look, you know, you've got the, the report coming out on the 12th of September, we'll all be in the cathedral. Um, why don't you all walk in together, show to the outside, you'll have the world's media there, show unity, walk in collectively. And if you can't do it for yourselves, do it for the 96. I said, um, there's been differences over the years, people have different, you know, politics, whatever, but the common thing you've got, let it all bring you back together for this. And um, it went down like a lead balloon. Um, people in our group were going, oh yeah, you were right for saying that. And it was so, and then, I got accused by the f one of, a relative of one of them. It was great, I mean, it, I got accused, it was a tweet. Um, there she goes again, shooting her mouth off, being divisive with her calls for unity, which I thought was good. <laughs> so, um, so, um, and the saddest thing was in, and again, in the cathedral, you see, because how they play, I'll give you the, the visual thing, just what you're saying, in the cathedral. We pushed and pushed and made sure that everyone was addressed by the panel at the same time, all the families, so we're all in the big part of the cathedral. And then the idea was you go off and to, you know, to discuss amongst yourselves and have a look at the report and if you needed any help and you know, then you could, you know, if you wanted the media, whatever. And so when they finished and the bishop said, you can all go off now. So there was a Home Office official over there with a big sign, Hillsborough Family Support Group this way, it was in that corner there. And there was someone there, Hillsborough Justice Campaign this side. You know where they put all us? In the dungeons where no phones would work or anything, there was no internet connection. So I just went, come on, we're not staying. Because it was a holding exercise. But that was quite, and then they had a third sign, families who don't belong to any group. And it was absolutely appalling. But it was expedient, and I totally agree with you. If you can't come together, you don't have to like each other. God, I've been involved in enough things where I can't stand people. But um, in terms of, if you can't come together and go, look, when we walk out the door, we mightn't even talk to each other. Are we all agreed on this? Can't even go to that. As I said, um, when, when they heard that Mike Mansfield was going to be representing families, one of the families um, <coughs> rang Mansfield's office and said, you know, is he going to represent all families? And he, they replied to him and said, uh, yeah, he's prepared to represent all families. That was on the Monday. By the time it was in the cathedral, Mike Mansfield turned to this individual and said, oh, it's nothing to do with me. Uh, you'll have to speak to the family support group. And he said, no. So, so what I'm saying is it's a real problem and I agree. And I have really tried loads of ways and tried to get, I've, you know, to get people to do it. And it really, it really distresses survivors, I have to say. Um, some survivors get really upset at the divisions um, because for the reasons you say, yeah. Well, just to say what you're saying about with Mike Mansfield, if he's actually separating you and splitting you, it's a hell of a job for you to stick together then. Well, the thing, the thing is that he's doing it because he's employed by the family support group. I, um, so you asked, yeah, yeah. Um, the so one, yeah, the yeah. one, the one big body that you can particularly reference in all of this, you talk about the council, the government, the police, the different agencies of the state, the FI, the club. Yeah, yeah. The club's been through several different owners in the period, and we've now got a supporters committee, and Karen sends her apologies for not being here. So she's gone back, hasn't she? She's yeah. gone back. And I have to be on the supporters committee myself, and a lot of us are really you know, very, very concerned, um, wanting to do the right things, wanting to take forward these actions and more. 
What else do you want from the club? Well, all we've ever wanted from the club has been acknowledgement um, and all we've ever said, and I, you'll know this because you're part of Spirit of Shankly supporters, um, we've never asked for... I'm not part of SOS. Oh no, you're part of the supporters committee. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, and that's, yes, apologies. Um, I've got committees coming, yeah. Um, the first thing we asked them for was a ball. and. Um, we actually quote Ricky Tomlinson on our website because we, we wrote to all the clubs in the Premiership um, saying, uh, can, could, you, could we have a signed ball? And Ricky was quoted as saying something which I thought was great because he went, we've got loads of balls, which I think sums us up really, you know. So, um, but we did and we had, a, we had a football from everyone except Liverpool Football Club and we still, you know. That, that sounds petty, but that sort of paved the way. Over the years, they have refused to acknowledge us. Um, we've been thrown out. I've gone into shareholders' meetings prior to the Americans as proxy votes and been thrown out, and families have been thrown out in that. And um, I know that supporters have asked questions recently under the new ownership of it all. And officially, what has been saying, well, there are these divisions, um, and we don't want to interfere unofficially and you'd probably know this that what's being said is our family support group won't have anything to do with us if we talk to them and i know that's a fact i do have to say there are changes recently um how begrudgingly it was and i did look at the check to see if it'd been signed in blood by ian air but we did receive a check off them towards the monument which we've commissioned which was such a huge step forward and i won't go into how that happened but it was it was like kind of um it was beyond you know also as well after the report um, we were invited to the man U game when i say we um representatives from the justice campaign and when we were there there was um i was there with our chair who's a survivor kenny uh, and williams couldn't go but her son was there with her, her brother and um, two people from the family support group were there and um, it was separate. Now we obviously spoke to the people from Anne's group and we were ignored um, and so even though you and we were sitting all together in a row you'll see pictures. Now the club can only break that by saying we're treating everybody the same. We're treating, we acknowledge. Now by inviting us they acknowledge the three groups <coughs> it's a difficult one now because Anne Williams is and is essentially what she calls hope for Hillsborough but we have joined ranks on the um, for legal representation which is you know um, which is what we see as the practical way to do things but for the club to then acknowledge that was such a major thing forward from you know but I mean that is all we have I know I know and I know what you've come up against as well. And I know what's gone on behind the scenes and what's gone on formally. But, and actually, I don't think the, the supporters committee pushing it is, has really brought it because it was, I think, this is my own take on it, that the Americans are getting wind of it and going, oh, hang on a minute, what's going on here? This is not good PR. Because you know the volume of support and the support we have. So really all we want is that continued acknowledgement um, the role of Liverpool in relation to Hillsborough and, and what happened and everything I think is something I've omitted and it's something for another time.